Hi guys, Jangro here, and welcome to this episode 18 of this Valhelsia Enhanced Vanilla Hardcore Playthrough. In this episode, I thought we'd do a kind of a base walkthrough, a showcase of all the Tech Reborn and Applied Energistic systems that we have set up, because sometimes I think it's just useful to see what other people do. I'm not going to build these things, I'll just try to show them with as much detail as I can. Okay, there's a lot here, but let's first take a look at our power. I've been doing a lot of quarrying, as you saw, and I've used up a lot of my power store. It's catching up now, but I thought it'd be a good idea to just beef up our power generation. And if we make some ultimate solar panels over here, we can auto craft it. And let's just make a bunch, 10 of them. So we'll start. This is going to go through the motions to create our ultimate solar panels. While that's doing that, let's just start taking a look at our base tour here. So again, up on the roof is our solar panels. We'll be back up here to add some more to that. This is our single tech reborn machine system over here. They're all connected with pattern providers. You may recall in a previous episode, I had import buses on the bottoms of these, which just isn't necessary. I didn't realize it at the time because pattern providers also have return inventory. So they can send stuff back without an importer, which allows us to put two pattern providers on each machine very easily. So that kind of doubles the number of patterns we can send into one of those machines. I've got some more around back over here. These are basically all of our single Tech Reborn machines. Sounds like it's finished. It is. Let's put the solar panels. We're going to need some more fiber. We've got it. And let's just add to our solar panel setup here. Okay. Even at night, they're generating power. If we go to sleep, where's my sleeping bag? Here it is. These were all filling up pretty slowly before. Now as the sun come up, comes up, they're going to fill up much faster. Anyway, this is where our power comes down and it fills into the tops of these storage units, these MFEs. And here's a MFSU, which holds 40 million energy units. So this is kind of the, the big guy in that array and all the outputs come out the bottom. So we don't mix input and outputs in our network. This over here also comes up from our thermal generators generating power downstairs. So again, all the power comes in these batteries and all the, everything is fed from, from those batteries. So it keeps all the power kind of central. Okay. So while we're talking about tech reborn kind of infrastructure, again, here is our lava generation to feed these thermal generators, which are connected to a daylight sensor so that they only run at night to supplement the solar generators. And here's where we have, this is below the, this is below the lava that's up there. And here we have all our drives and this is our ME fluid storage cell. This is where some of that lava is getting stored, but these are where all our drives are stored. And this is also infinitely expandable in the same way the lava one is just with this storage bus connected with an interface and we can put and then this we can just put another storage bus over here connected to an interface on this side and create the same thing over and over again and through just a single channel which is this one right here we can have an infinite number of me drives this is a really good use of a subnetwork you'll start to see that subnetworks are pretty useful and allow us to conserve channels because with applied energistics Smart cables just serve eight channels. Dense smart cables serve 32. Now we mentioned our wireless crafting terminal that we have in our right hand here. And I can, again, I can just right click and it acts as a, as a terminal. And that is being served by this wireless access point, which has six boosters in it to expand the range. Without any boosters at all, its range is only 16 blocks in a radius. And if we put in these boosters, we can get up to 30 
or so blocks radius, which is about enough for my base right now. We can add more, but it gets us all the way up into our villager trading hall, which is upstairs, which is kind of the farthest point that we need access. When you make a wireless crafting terminal, you need to connect it to your network, and that's done in a security terminal. And so when you first craft it, it's not linked. You see it says linked down there. You just drop it in a security terminal connected to the to your network and it will it'll link it. This security terminal does other things, but we don't need that stuff right now. Here we have all the energy cells for our AE system, just to make sure we've got enough backup power in case we we lose power, because losing access to all our storage is a disaster. And here's a cell workbench where we can configure cells. It's useful for a few things. And we've got our just our basic two crafting storage and co-processing units, which mostly keep us going. We haven't had to really expand these too much. We've got two 4K, so 8K crafting storage on two things. We've got a bunch of these assemblers and pattern providers. These all have all of our crafting patterns. This is our old inscriber automation. It's obsolete. I just kind of leave it here as kind of a relic of our early days. And yeah, I think that kind of covers the infrastructure of the applied energistic setup. There's a whole lot of automation um, and crafting automation that happens. And we'll talk about that next. Okay, let's head up here. Now, since we mentioned the inscriber automation, let's start there. So the one downstairs was only kind of semi-automatic. I had to fill all the hoppers with the individual um, ingredients and then it would automatically craft the stuff. But this one does it fully with, a pa with patterns. And so here we have our pattern provider and it has these three processing patterns in it. They have redstone, silicon, and the individual ingredient, gold, diamond, and certus quartz. And that feeds this subnetwork. Again, this is all served off a single channel, which is pretty cool. This quartz fiber breaks the network connection. So it's a subnetwork. Everything comes in. Let's let's go ahead and make a logic processor. Let's make 10 of these. 11, whatever. And we can see here that. The gold ingots they come in here to make the printed logic circuit. It then flows up through the back here where there's a storage bus. Comes up and into this into this inscriber right here, which handles the final creation of the processor. The silicon comes up into this inscriber, gets sent into this inscriber for that final step. And then everything, when it finishes here, it heads out back into this export bus going into the pattern provider and out back into the main storage. So here's the back side of this where all the, where everything happens. And I'll try to show this. So again, here we have the pattern provider pointing into this interface right here, which takes things out of the pattern provider and puts them into the network. Depending on what it is, if it's a diamond, it's going to go into this inscriber here. And that's done because this storage bus right here is configured with a diamond. Likewise, this storage bus is configured with Certus Quartz, and this storage bus is configured with a gold ingot. Now, it's important to have this set to filter on insertion only. So whatever this inscriber is crafting, it will send it back out through the storage bus when something else needs it. We could filter it um, with the um, printed circuit that it's making, but there's just no need if we have it filtering on insertion only. Okay, so those inscribers create their printed circuit. They come back out and up through here and into this inscriber right here, which is also configured to pull redstone dust from the network. So here, this storage bus pulls redstone dust. And this... export bus is what calls for these circuits. So there's an export bus on this end. This inscriber right here, by the way, is tipped on its side. You do that with a wrench. And so this end, again, the printed circuits come in. And on this end, just is a little mini network right here. So it doesn't even have to be configured. It's gonna always pull the printed silicon out of this inscriber. 
So storage bus with silicon right here, storage bus with redstone right here, storage bus with gold, storage bus with certus quartz, and certus bus with diamond, storage bus. Finally, this export bus here is configured to pull only these processors out. That way nothing else will get pulled out automatically because, and they'll go to other destinations. And that finishes the circuit. Really smart design, which I learned, which everyone learns from the YouTuber TKH. I'll link to this um, tutorial. It's a little outdated, but hopefully with this, you can see what's going on. Next, let's take a look over here where we make Certus Quartz Crystal and Fluix Crystal. And this is done in a bath with crystal growth accelerators. The yellow here is, is the power. And the power gets fed from this toggle bus right here. Only when Certus Quartz or Fluix Crystal is getting crafted. I also have one here for Fluix Dust, but we don't make Fluix Dust here really anymore. So it's just basically these two. So when Fluix, a Fluix Crystal or a Certus Quartz Crystal are being crafted, because there's a crafting card in this level emitter, that redstone lights up, which turns on this toggle, which lets power come through here, which only powers the four growth accelerators. So that's the power part. But back here to the beginning, we've got our two patterns here, Certus Quartz Crystal and Fluix Crystal made with the seeds. It import, it sends these seeds into this orange cable, which goes straight into this formation plane, which is configured to take what's most relevant here is the Certus Quartz seed and these Fluix seeds. And it's configured to drop things as an item and not a block. That's important to configure that. They drop into here and get cooked by the water with all the acceleration on them and and they float to the top. And once they float up, they hit this annihilation plane, which pulls them into the network. This purple is the output and it just brings the stuff, sends it back into the pattern provider with this storage bus, which is configured only to pull these crystals out. It's important that this is a storage bus, not an exporter, because the annihilation plane requires some sort of storage. You could also put a ME chest or something as a buffer. You'll see some videos like that, but a storage bus will do the trick. Let's watch this work. So we've already got 2000 Certus Quartz crystals, but let's make some more. So if we make a hundred of these, why not? And we've already got a hundred seeds and it's going and I've got a magnet on, so that is bad. So there's a lesson, never have your magnet on when you're dealing with this. Let's try that again and make another 100. This time we've used up some seeds, so now we need to craft some more, but that's all right. Those will get crafted with, this is a, this is a good place to remind you that to make 100 crystals, you only need half that number of dust. And that's important because that allows us to we'll learn in a second double basically our quartz crystal. So we're going to craft these seeds. You can see here the level emitter went on because we're now crafting Certus Quartz crystals. And those crafted seeds are getting dumped into the water by the formation plane. Now, thanks to our four accelerators, those seeds are going to grow up pretty quickly. So we can sit here and watch that happen. This is a relatively new dynamic in applied energistics where completed seeds float like this. You see they disappear in the annihilation plane. You'll see some videos where the annihilation plane is on the bottom and the formation plane um, is on the top, which is fun to watch because the seeds kind of fall out like a shower, but it doesn't work as well because when the annihilation plane is on the bottom and the, seed, and the finished crystals are floating up, it can't catch them all. So this is really the optimal design for the crystal generator. Okay, let's take a look next at the uh, how we make dust. So if you look at the recipe for Certus Quartz dust, if in a grinder, it takes two Certus Quartz to make one dust, which is kind of equal because one dust with a sand makes a seed, makes two seeds. So one dust makes two crystals. However, with the inscriber, you can 
turn one Sardis Quartz crystal into one dust, and that combined with one sand makes two crystals. So you can effectively double your Sirtis Quartz crystal um, with that with that dynamic. So here we've got basically three inscribers, all with these the same patterns in them, making Sirtis Quartz dust and Fluix dust. And basically this is allows us to kind of triple our production by having three of the same recipes. And it will, if we craft some Sirtis Quartz dust, let's make a hundred of it. You can see it does all three machines at the same time. And we've got acceleration cards on here, so it's quick. So again, we can double. So if you just have basically one Sirtis Quartz dust, you can then make two crystals. And then with those two crystals, you can make two Sirtis Quartz dusts and you can double your Sirtis Quartz from there. And the same thing with Fluix dust. This over here is just simply a the charger. And we've got this pattern provider here with a pattern that takes crystal and turns it into charged crystal. There's an import bus on this side that just pulls it out when it's done. So if we make some charged Sirtis Quartz, so if we tell it to make 10 start, they just come in here, charge up, and come out. The import bus just pulls out the crystal. So on this side of the charger, it only is output, and this side of the charger, it's in. Likewise, I didn't mention the backs of these inscribers all have import buses. So that's how the items get back into the network. In this case, pattern providers cannot pull back out because the output is not the same as the input. So we need import buses on this. Okay, so that is kind of all of the applied Energistics 2 crafting for certain, you know, the crystals, dusts, and processors. Let's head down and look at the multi-blocks. Before we do that, let's grab some emeralds. We also dump a few things back in here. Grab some emeralds and go buy some diamond armor from our armorer. That's okay, keep, keep the change. Now, head down a few levels to our bottom level. Just give some bearings of where we are here. There's the original basement room of our of our base. Over here is where I've been building all of the tech reborn multi-block structures. So we, here we've got the industrial blast furnace, which has been upgraded with advanced machine casings. There's one more upgrade we can do for this, which is industrial machine casings. It's got the industrial blast furnace here with the pattern provider, which is handles all of our blast furnace recipes. We've also got another blast furnace connected on this side, which is not patterns, it's just a place to make diamonds. So there's a recipe in the blast furnace for that turns blast furnace. With the blast furnace, you can turn diamond armor back into their diamonds combined with sand. So now you can't do recipes for this because armor doesn't really match patterns, um, but we don't really need that. It's kind of overkill. So what we do is we've got this export bus which just pulls sand out and always keeps this bottom slot full of sand. And over here on the right is our diamond input chest. And if we put our, I should have disenchanted these, but whatever. And now it's turning these diamond armor that we basically got for free because we've got unlimited emeralds. So we've essentially got unlimited diamonds and dark ashes, which is useful for making steel, I think. So all the diamonds we want, thanks to that. Over here, is our industrial grinder. This is our water grinder, and it takes water from this export bus. We used to have an infinite water source with a drain dumping into here, but we needed water in other places, so I moved it. But we've got this export bus, which puts the water in, keeps it full always. And over here is a pattern provider with all of our water industrial grinder recipes. All right, over here, now it's really cool that you can, can we can put multiple machines on a single multi-block. This is our Mercury industrial grinder. Same setup. Export bus down the bottom this time because we just got the power coming in the top. This one pulls in Mercury. Now I've got this one set to with a capacity card. I can put more things in here. It pulls in just Mercury from fluid storage or pulls in a Mercury cell, which in this case it's easier to make Mercury cells than Mercury. So we just pull that in here and 
the pattern provider over here has for now just our one iridium nugget, which is a critical recipe to get iridium from sheldonite. It also makes platinum and nickel. If we craft some iridium nuggets, crafts 10 out of five sheldonite ores, which we get out of the end. You can see the bucket, the cells, also, they just this just keeps them full of cells. I don't have them in the pattern. As it runs out, it's gonna add, it'll add more cells into our system. Over here, we have a third block on this multi-block, which is our sawmill. And this one also requires water, so we have the export bus pulling water in, the pattern provider with the patterns, and the sawmill is a, just a really simple machine. It gives us from logs, it gives us planks, dust, and paper. All the paper you could want by just by creating planks here. Last multi-block for now is the implosion compressor, which is also a pretty simple machine. It doesn't do much. It has a pattern provider in the back, and right now it just makes iridium alloy plates out of iridium alloy ingots, which is a critical item. And we just need the implosion compressor for that. This one has advanced machine casings, just like the blast furnace, which makes it pretty expensive. All right, so those are all of the Tech Reborn multi-blocks. Three structures with six machines on them. Okay, so in addition to just crafting on demand, which is what happens with all these things with pattern providers, if we need a tungsten ingot, it the pattern sends raw tungsten over here to create that ingot. But sometimes it's useful to have a whole bunch of some item in stock. The simplest way to do this is with a an ME interface configured with a storage bus on it. So it, so we've got this thing configured here. This is saying here, keep these number of items in here. And it literally just stores that number of things. So if I take out these 64 stone bricks, it's got an auto craft, it's got a crafting card and it makes 64 more. Take those out. It's gonna make 64 more thanks to the crafting card because basically just says, hey, we always need to keep this much stuff. So you can put a whole bunch of these interfaces and keep these items in stock. Not sure why we have a storage cell sitting there. Now there are other ways to keep things in stock. And if we head back downstairs, this is how we keep our water in stock. So I've moved this infinite water supply. It's sitting on top of a drain, which is sitting on top of a tank unit. So it's always gonna keep this tank unit full of water. Now, when we need more water, we don't just constantly fill up our network with water. We've got a level emitter and it is configured to keep 5,000 buckets of water. And if we take a look at water, probably have a little bit more than that. Yeah, we've got 5,291 buckets of water. If I change this, oh, so this level emitter is gonna turn on this toggle, which will let power in here, which will then power the storage bus connected to an interface. So it basically treats the entire network like a storage drive and will just dump with a with an exporter underneath there. Sorry, an importer, an import bus. It will pull water when just when it's powered on and just dump it into the network. So if we configure this emitter, let's set it to 6,000, the power goes on and it's just pulling water out of here. and putting it into our system. And if we take a look again here, it's filling this thing up with water. That's a lot of water. Let's drop that down to 5,500. We can actually watch it stop. There, now we can see the emitter down here. As soon as this hits 5,500, this emitter will turn off. There, now it's off, the water stops coming in. Here's another system that takes, uses tech, re, tech reborn machines. This is our redstone creator right here. There's a recipe which creates redstone in the centrifuge from netherrack dust and other things, nuggets, sulfur cell, and coal dust. So we've kind of got this contained system here that will take Netherrack from the network 
again, when it's powered, we've got an emitter here, and we keep 2,000 redstone. And if we make this, let's see, how much redstone do we have? We have exactly 2,000. So let's set this to 3,000. And now it's going to create 1,000 more redstone. Each redstone takes 16 netheracks. Do we have enough netherrack? 173,000, I think we've got enough. So the nether, the comes into the grinder over here and puts the netherrack into the centrifuge with an empty cell. Now we have this centrifuge up here, which processes the empty sulfur cell. The empty cell gets spit back down into the centrifuge. So we have the same 16 cells just cycling through here and it spits out the sulfur dust on this end on the output. So this machine takes netherrack in, spits out sulfur dust, redstone, and gold nuggets. And when it fills up to 3,000 redstone, it's going to stop. Let's stop it at... Let's just stop it. That was the wrong level emitter. Now it's stopped. It's back to 2,000. We have another machine over here that takes soul sand as an input and or soul soil and creates salt heater. Same kind of process. Takes 16 soul sand and 16 empty cells and will create salt heater and oil goes up here, which just gets emptied into our network with this import bus. And again, this is an export bus that takes soul sand and soul soil. Again, again, only when the power is turned on. So instead of auto crafting these things on demand, we're keeping we're we're crafting when there's when the level of something goes below a threshold, which is what these emitters are good for. Now, the reason we're making all this stuff is redstone is obviously critical, but we're also creating all of the ingredients just with this machine, almost for gunpowder. This is the recipe for gunpowder. So saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal dust. Unfortunately, coal dust doesn't work. Otherwise, this would be a completely self-contained gunpowder crafter. But we need charcoal dust, not coal dust. All right, so there's a look at some of our auto crafting and auto storage for um, you know keeping certain levels of items. One more thing to show you probably the most confusing machine. So I saved it for last, which is this system right here. Also a subnetwork, like most of these other things we looked at, it only uses one channel. And what this does is basically it's a compactor. So it takes nuggets and automatically compacts them into ingots. And this is important because of our copper pan system is constantly churning out gold nuggets and iron nuggets. So the way this works, I'll try to explain this in full detail here. We've got this storage bus, which this is what's connected to our network. So, and it's set up to only store diamond nuggets, diamond dust, gold nuggets, and iron nuggets in this system. It's got a drive in here, an ME chest, which just has a 1K storage in it. So it doesn't really actually keep very much because once it gets things in, if it has enough, it will create, it'll craft these things with this little mini assembler system here, which is a 1K crafting storage assembler and a pattern provider. Now, the reason it takes it automatically crafts things is because we have this export bus over here pointing back into this interface and into the network with a crafting card. So it has a crafting card in it, which says, I always want to export things if I can craft them. And so it's always going to craft an iron nugget if there's enough things in here to craft an actual iron nugget. So nuggets, gold nuggets, for example, get stored whenever they're put into the system. It doesn't pull existing ones in. It has to be inserted newly into the system. They get stored here. When there's eight, well, nine, it will automatically craft that nugget and send it back out. So here's an interface right here that's just here to connect the storage bus to the ME chest. 
Things are stored here until there's nine or enough of them to make the thing. They get crafted and get sent back out to the network with the export bus. And so there we have basically a compactor. So any of these small dusts that we get from Tech Reborn, we can create recipes like I did here with the, I, I turn small dust, four, four small dusts into diamond dust. So I've got that little small source of, of diamonds coming from the recycler. And again, we also, back to this, make sure that this is why this is here, because we always keep 64 nuggets in the system. So we can watch this work by crafting some nuggets. So we take some gold ingots and turn them into nuggets, and we put them into our system. It's going to automatically put them in here. And you can see that they are getting crafted automatically. And if we take a look and see what's happening here, these 184 nuggets are getting just crafted into ingots. Really cool, really cool system. Again, by YouTuber TKH is where I learned how to do this. And again, it's a little bit outdated. So hopefully this clears things up for the most recent version of Applied Energistics. All right, I think we're going to stop there. That is pretty much an entire walkthrough of all the Tech Reborn and Applied Energistics systems that we have here. If you have any questions about them, let me know in the comments. I would be happy to put together maybe a full build video on any one of these individual machines. Uh, but those would be individual episodes all on their own. So uh, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. And please subscribe, like the video. And uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.